no matter who you may have been in the story of that very first Pentecost, one of the disciples or maybe a resident of Jerusalem or maybe one of the pilgrims that had arrived there for the festival, there is no doubt that to have borne witness to the moment that we've just heard read would have been a life changing experience. No one looks upon Pentecost without experiencing change. Change can be welcome. It could be a very needed thing, a very longed for or desired, hoped for moment. Or change can be a sudden and brutal, unexpected moment that is everything in you wanting to reject. We're all really well versed in change, in change that comes upon us quite suddenly with consequences that are really very unwanted. This last year of restrictions and their subsequent easing has done that. And we have all learned something about how we each ourselves manage change. Change means new forms of awareness, of commitments, of agency or power. And to participate in Pentecost necessarily means that we ourselves are open to being changed. To welcome Pentecost means to welcome a change to what was before, to a possibility of something that lies ahead. So today I want to talk to all of us about what it might mean to welcome Pentecost into our shared life today at St Francis Church. The Spirit comes and moves us in different ways, sending us into places, nesting us in places, always inviting us to be changed together and individually, continually moving, continually shaping, continually transforming. In this coming week, we've already mentioned that we have our APCM, our annual meeting, and we're going to be looking back over that year that was 2020. A difficult year in so many ways, and yet a year that changed all of us together and individually. A year where the wind of the spirit ushered in change all the while as we experienced the faithfulness and mercy of God. I wanted to hear those words that Carol read from 1 Peter chapter 5 again this morning because I believe they speak something very directly to us as a congregation in this moment of change, in this season of Pentecost. A season that's also seeing us move through this pandemic into what we hope is a sustained move out of lockdown and a season whereby we can give thanks to God for leading us to this point. Despite the loss and the confusion, despite the disorientation and the grief, God has brought us through, has led us into this moment. And our annual report that accompanies the APCM, which I think probably all of us have seen, speaks of the many ways that in the midst of, midst of what felt like a terrible year, we saw God's hand at work, work as he changed and transformed us, as he prepared us. And we've been in a Pentecost season for some time. When I was reminded a couple of weeks ago um, of these words from 1 Peter at the end of Peter's first letter, they struck me as words that could have been written for us today. And I bring them to you all as words of encouragement this morning, words that recognise something of where we've been, yet promise us something of God and what is yet to come. Those who received Paul's first letter back in the first century were people whose lives had been changed radically by the gospel. They were living lives that were incredibly countercultural to what was going on around them, and they were living scattered across what is now modern day Turkey. Peter wrote that letter to remind the Christians that theirs is a life called into being by God for his purposes alone, reminding them of the hope that their faith gives them for life, for the life of the community, that they're to embody God's holiness and to live out the mission to which they were called. Or rather, if we could rephrase it, their calling individually and together is to continue Christ's own mission. Theirs then 
as it is ours today. And each of us has a role to play in this, because when we declare a faith in God through Jesus, we're also acknowledging our own role that we have to play in working out God's purposes. All of us move into full time ministry in that sense. Now, full time ministry isn't about whether you're ordained, whether you're the vicar or the curate, whether you're licensed. It isn't about whether you're paid or whether you're not paid. It's not about whether you know lots of bits of the Bible or maybe you can only remember one story from when you were a child in Sunday school. It's not about whether you can pray with really long words or whether it is that you use very childlike language. Our ministry, none of our ministries are defined in those terms. Our ministry is about how we go about using the gifts that God has given us to help build the kingdom in the way that each of us are called. Because when you say yes to God, you say yes to entering full-time ministry. That means that you could end up in full-time ministry in your household, in your home, amongst your friends, in your workplace, in your school, in your college, in the place of the group to which you belong, the place that you find yourself in day in, day out. Because Christ's mission is to the world. It's not to the church. None of us are called to join an exclusive club and keep the doors closed with all those undesirables outside and all of us nice people on the inside. That is not the mission of Christ. Christ's mission was to take the word into the world, to work with God, to bring about change and transformation by being with those who don't know who Jesus is. And that's exciting and it's a privilege and it's an honour that God who creates all things invites you and I to continue in that mission for the world, in the community, in the place that he has put you, in the here and now. But the world is a dangerous place. The world did not accept or understand God's mission when Jesus walked the earth. In fact, the world rejected that mission to the point of killing Jesus. God's mission is rejected. Rejected by the world then and rejected by the world today. So when we join in with that mission, we too are rejected by the world. We're invited then to suffer for the sake of the gospel to be part of a mission that the world rejects. That's a mission that suffers. And so just as Christ himself suffered, so we suffer when we participate in that call because the world, because Satan is prowling around, is working to stop the building of the kingdom. And that world will sell us lie after lie to get us to collude, to pursue wealth, to pursue power, instead of pursuing the kingdom of God. To engage in Pentecost is to engage in being changed for the kingdom. And when Peter writes this letter, he is offering us direct wisdom here. If you have a Bible, get it open to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to pick it up from verse 6. He's offering us this idea that suffering, this idea of suffering, that's so alien, so terrifying to us because we're conditioned to the world's lies that we've got to be really radical. And when we pick it up in verse six, he says, humble yourself. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. When we do this, we entrust ourselves to God's care in a really profound way. Because it's when we fail to entrust ourselves, to humble ourselves to God, that we fall the, to the temptation of worldly ways. When we fail to entrust ourselves to God, when we fail to embody holiness, to live out this calling, this identity we have in Christ, then it becomes far more important for us to maintain privilege, to keep ourselves better than the next person, to accumulate wealth, to be successful, to be popular and have status, and we end up not being part of the change that Pentecost is inviting us to take part in. It's risky. 
because it's a definitive moment. Rejecting the temporal security of the world causes us an anxiety. What if we're wrong? Anxiety that Peter tells us here, hand that over, cast your anxieties upon him as part of our entrusting God. The fears and the concerns that paralyze us and stop us from being open to that Pentecost change, we've got to cast them back to God because we're entrusting ourselves. God is a God who we can trust. This isn't us rolling over and giving up, giving up to a God who may choose or not to look after us. It's not that. This is a rejection of the world by throwing ourselves or our concerns or our fears, who we are, onto God. And that demands then, picking up from Peter, that we stay alert and we are disciplined because the world, the devil, is in full scale war against God's kingdom. That's the mission you and I are involved in. And it's big stuff and it is scary stuff. And it's the stuff of Pentecost. It's the stuff of transformation. It's the stuff of the kingdom. And we do well to take part in it wholly, not playing around the edges, not opting in for the bits we like and the bits we don't. We're weak. We're weak and we just need to entrust ourselves, humble ourselves to God, because it's then we discover in that weakness that we're made strong in Christ. Those that I have known who have really done this in their lives are the most prayerful, spirit filled people I've ever met. They absolutely do not have the trappings of the world that encumber them. They're not striving for wealth or for power or for being popular. Rather, they're just content in Christ, used by God, honoured by God, gifted and personally fulfilled. The spirit enables and empowers us, just as she did the disciples on that very first day of Pentecost. Church, I think that now is the time for us to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Now is the time for us to entrust ourselves fully to God, to take our place in his mission. Church, I believe we've been, been prepared for a really special moment, a moment that has been coming for several years. I believe God's offering us a moment of invitation for us to say, yes, we're in for that mission knowing it's going to be hard because the world is set against us. And let's face it, it has already been quite hard. We are battling the world. The mission of God has suffered here in this church over the years, and we're tired and we're worn out. And the thought of new things, of change, and the thought of suffering, more suffering, well, at the best, that feels overwhelming. But here's the thing. I believe that in 1 Peter 5, we are being offered a promise, a promise for us. Because those verses we've read go on to say this. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. Let me repeat that. It says, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen and establish you. Church, I believe we can claim that promise for us, that God is ready to restore us, to support us, to strengthen us and to establish us. That's the kind of change, that's the kind of transformation that I think we could all long for. As of today, we find ourselves in places that are starting to open up after a very dark time. That dark time that has been a place of suffering. We find ourselves with new ideas in our hearts. Yet these ideas perhaps do seem difficult or overwhelming, perhaps even impossible. Messy church, returning to church on a Sunday, coming in in person. Yet God promises 
to restore us. He promises to support us. He promises to strengthen us and he's promising to establish us. What do we need to do? We need to take up and live out that identity that we have in Christ to embody God's holiness. We need to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. We know the world is working against God's mission. We know the devil is seeking to bring it down at every turn. Nonetheless, we need to accept the mission and the promise that comes with it, that we will be restored, that we will be supported, we will be strengthened and we will be established. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen.